Thank you so much. Are we on, Kevin? Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. I do appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, seeing this big crowd, I've got one question. Why aren't you folks eating lunch outdoors? It's such a beautiful day. I can't believe we're inside. My, my first inclination was, let's go on the front porch and do this, but I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk today. If you came, by the way, for a formal, quote, academic presentation, that's not me, okay? I apologize. That's not me. I want to talk about just an informal talk about Civil War Mobile. Mobilians are, as you know, strange people. I've been there 56 years all my life. It's a different part of the state, if not the world. We are very proud of our history, sometimes too much so. The joke in Mobile is, how many Mobilians does it take to change a light bulb? Answer is four. Okay, why four? One puts in the new bulb, the other three talk about how great the old bulb was. So we are, we are pretty much steeped in history. The topic today is Civil War Mobile. Now, I know in this crowd we've got some sharp eyes. This drawing is post-Civil War. I'll show you, you can tell later on, it's not a Civil War drawing, but it's pretty accurate as far as Government Street's con concerned. We're not going to talk today so much about military stuff as we are political, social, and economic. At the end of the talk, I'll get to some military stuff. I'll go through some slides, some scenes from Mobile, including the Battle of Mobile Bay. But I want to talk today about Mobile and how it played into the overall scheme of things in the Confederacy. I've got a few quotes to start with here. Mobilians, you've got to expect these guys are enthusiastic about their town. I start with a quote here, a local writer named Thomas Cooper DeLeon in 1861 described Mobile this way, and I quote, located at the head of her beautiful bay with a wide sweep of blue water before her, the cleanly built unpaved streets gave Mobile a fresh, cool aspect. The houses were fine, their appointments in good and sometimes luxurious taste. The society was a very pleasure-loving organization, enjoying the gifts of situation of climate and of fortune to their full. Likewise, a Mobilian in DeBose Review said this, the fine climate, the suburban attractions, and the creation of a thousand allurements that cluster around social life have operated much in her favor. One, one citizen summed up Mobile this way, quote, there is no more delectable city on all the Gulf of Mexico than Mobile. Well, those are Mobilians. You expect that. But nationally, in the 1850s and 60s, Mobile enjoyed a fairly good reputation also. Here's a guy you know, William Howard Russell, British correspondent of the London Times, came to Mobile in 1861. He explored Mobile's social scene. He found a city which, quote, abounds in oyster saloons, drinking houses, beer and wine shops, gambling and dancing places. Today we call that Dolphin Street in Mobile. It's still, it's still like that. He also said Mobile was, quote, the most foreign-looking city I have yet seen in the state. And in his mind, that's a very great compliment. Now, here's an odd one. William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, he's not known as being a lover of southern cities, as we know, during the war. Sherman was actually stationed in Mobile in the 1850s at Fort Morgan. He said this in a letter to his sister. He said, quote, on the river, it resembles any other business city, but as you leave the wharves and go back, you find beautiful streets of hotels, stores, and shops, all as graciously ornamented as in New York. So locally and nationally, and in some cases internationally, Mobile was on the radar as being a fine southern city. Some background, by 1861, Mobile had already compiled more than a century and a half of a historical record that included relocation, colonial rule, deadly disease, financial struggles, several natural as well as man-made disasters. For the first 100 years in existence, the flags of France, Britain, and Spain had flown successfully over the city. When the U.S. finally got this territory, the size of Mobile changed drastically. Here's a few numbers. In 1840, here's some census records. In 1840, the city had 13,631 people. In 1860, it's nearly 30,000. Now, that 30, it doubled, more than doubled. Of that 30,000, you had 20,854 whites 
817 free blacks, 7,587 slaves. Now, I digress. Students ask me all the time, without many plantations in Mobile, why the slaves? Well, obviously the docks, because the cotton came to Mobile, the docks, the home, the private homes, uh, the warehouses, lots of chances for slavery in Mobile. Now, the writer a while ago used the word allurements. I love that word. Mobile indeed had many allurements. Here's some examples. If you were a guest or a transient resident, you could choose from several hotels, most notably the just completed Battle House Hotel. There's three banks, including the Bank of Mobile, that serve the needs of commerce and credit. You could do government business at the U.S. Customs Houses. There were 13 foreign consulates in Mobile. There were nine insurance companies, six post office branches, uh, five hospitals. That's amazing. This is, by the way, in 1860. Um, Organizations, Mobilians loved to join organizations, things like the Protestant Orphan Asylum, not to be outdone, the Catholic Orphan Asylum, the Female Benevolent Society, the Samaritan Society, my favorite, the Can't Get Away Club. Now, <laughs> this I love, just very informally, why would you call an organization the Can't Get Away Club? Any thoughts on that? It's simple. These are the folks. Mobile, for all those nice words, was a godless swamp in the summertime downtown. The, if you know Mobile, the Spring Hill area, if you've been to Mobile and know that area where the Bragg Mitchell house is, these big mansions away from the river, the rich folks in the summertime would leave the river and just go several miles, but it's uphill, away from the swamp fog, the mosquitoes in the Spring Hill area. The Can't Get Away Club, these are folks that literally can't get away. They're stuck. They organize and, and have all kinds of good times, I guess. Religious denominations, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Episcopal, Presbyterian all flourished. There were 24, in 1860, 24 Christian places of worship, two Jewish synagogues. The meeting houses ranged from cathedrals, which are still there, to federal-style column buildings, to wooden structures. There was even a floating chapel in the river for the transient sailors. So every range of religious worship there. Those so inclined could join civic organizations. Everything from the Masons, the Odd Fellows, the Franklin Society, the Sons of Temperance, the Temple of Honor, mystic societies, fire companies, and military units. This amazes people. The reading public at one point was served by four partisan daily newspapers. Today we have in Mobile zero. We have no daily paper. They had four partisan newspapers. Mobile's youth went to the very first public school in Alabama in the 1860s. There was a medical college which taught surgery, uh, anatomy, physiology, pathology, obstetrics, chemistry. The Jesuits ran Spring Hill College. So in 1860, Mobile is flourishing. Now, notwithstanding, Mobile, notwithstanding those allurements, Mobile's importance was as an economic center, obviously because of the cotton trade. A few stats here. Alabama was the second largest cotton producing state in the nation. Most of its bales were sold in and transported through Mobile. Here's a stat. Mobile's $3.7 million in exports was second among southern ports only to New Orleans. The in-state river system gave Mobile a connection to the interior, while Mobile Bay gave that connection to the world. So it's a natural funnel. For the cotton being grown up here, there's that natural funnel. Mobile was served by two railroads, very important. The Mobile in Ohio would connect the city with Columbia, Kentucky. At Corinth, it crossed the east-west Memphis-Charleston line. In Meridian, it connected with the uh, Alabama-Mississippi line also. There's the Great Northern Railroad, which gave Mobile a connection toward Pensacola and toward the west. One bit of trivia, in the Civil War, the biggest troop movement by rail came through Mobile. It was when Braxton Bragg moved from, from, uh, to, from Mississippi and Tennessee to Kentucky, they came through Mobile, a large, large troop movement. Over 25,000 men would pass by rail through Mobile. Now, 
Mobile was on the radar as the war gets underway of a Union general, at least one guy, who said, quote, having communication the year round by river as well as by railroads in the heart of Alabama and Mississippi, it, Mobile, is one of the keys of the Confederacy. Now, with all these facts considered, it's easy to see why we have quotes like I started with, why people are high mobile, but as the war comes on and things change. What I want to talk about for a few minutes today is the aspects of mobile and how they're affected by the war. We'll look at political, we'll look at social, we'll look at economic. Now, politically, mobile in the 1850s, like all cities in the South and nation, goes through a major transformation. If you read Mobile newspapers in the 1840s, you look at elections, you look at debates, you look at political issues. The burning issues were things like the local banks, or dredging the river, or paving with oyster shells the streets. By the 1850s, to be mayor of Mobile, you've got to defend your position on slavery. Just like most southern towns, this slavery issue that gripped the nation would filter down to local politicians. It's bizarre to me to see a candidate for the city council of Mobile defending his position on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But it was that important to Mobile. Mobile was a strange place. One of the guys we'll look at after a while, John Forsyth, was a big part of this. Mobile was a more moderate part of the state. In the election of 1860, Mobile is one of the very few counties in the South, not, not states, but counties, that would support Stephen Douglas. The Mobile paper supported Douglas. Douglas came to Mobile several times, we'll see later. Mobile was more moderate, but even so, as the secession crisis comes along, as secession happens, Mobile, of course, will fall into lockstep with other cities, but all along the way in the 1850s, Mobile appeared to, at least on the surface, be a kind of a more moderate area compared to upstate. Now, beneath the surface, that's not the case. But in a lot of the official records and papers, including the register, you see this Douglas, more moderate slant. Now, as we go past the political part, once secession is declared, Mobile is convinced that they'll be attacked early on. Well, logic tells you that's the case. With the railroads and the port, the Mobile City Fathers believe Mobile's an early target. Mobile's mayor, a guy named Jones Withers, he resigns right away when the war starts. What would make the mayor resign right away? The calling for a commission in the Army, that's a better path to future, uh, a future career. He resigns. John Forsyth takes over as mayor. He's tasked with the defense of the city. Because they're convinced right away it'll be one of the first targets. That, by the way, never comes, but they're convinced in 1861 Mobile is that prime target. We'll see in a few moments on a slide the plans, the elaborate plans to defend the city, which, by the way, causes great controversy. There's talk of refortifying the forts in the bay. There's floating torpedoes in the bay. There are floating batteries in the river. They build these massive redoubts and redoubts along the city perimeters to protect against what they're sure will be that very soon attack. Now, socially, Mobile, it, when I say this, it's kind of strange. Mobile, though, remained fairly normal during the war. Now, I put that in quotation marks because we'll see it's not the case, but compared to other places, like in Atlanta, or New Orleans, or a Charleston later on, much more normal. One soldier in Mobile wrote to his sister in 1864, he said, quote, our city is not at all changed in appearance. Now, during the war, most of Mobile continues to function. For example, the city government continues to operate, never, never slows down. Number two, the local courts held regular sessions. The churches remained open. The public schools never shut down in the entire war. In Mobile, if an ice flake falls, today we shut down. We, we close the entire city. In the entire Civil War, the public schools never shut down. The hospitals stayed open. From that point of view, it looks like there's a normal everyday life going on. Now, here is the underlying current. As the war ended, 
and the lost cause myth gets bigger and bigger, the story, the party line is the entire South supports the war wholeheartedly. There's no dissension. There's no opposition. If you look at Mobile, I'm amazed at how open dissension is. Now, some examples here. In Mobile, a lot of people are ambivalent or downright hostile to the war. Now, how do I know that? It's not just in their letters and diaries, it's in the paper. I'm amazed at what they print during the war, letters openly critical, openly hostile to the Confederate government, to military decisions, to the city fathers. In Mobile, you see lots of dissension in public records. In private, you would expect it, but in the public records. It was very hard to get volunteers to help with the city defenses. You would think in a crisis situation they'd be pouring in, you see appeals over and over again, we need volunteers. This attack is coming, we need volunteers to build these defenses. That didn't come. It was very hard in Mobile to get slave owners to allow their slaves to be used in building these defenses. The slave owners are very jealous of their property. They would not release the slaves to work on city projects. Um, it's amazing. You can look at stats in Mobile, the increase in property crimes and burglaries, very pronounced during the war years. A last one, this is a great idea. One of the great ideas, this should be across the street, this idea. In Mobile, there was an idea to have a, quote, voluntary tax to support the war effort, okay? How do you think that went? A voluntary tax did not go well. That was a farce. The voluntary tax never took off, but it shows us during the war, it was very tough in Mobile to get the population entirely on board. Now, many were, of course. This is a minority, but it's a vocal minority that you see during the war. There's a guy in Mobile named Gustavus Horton became the mayor of Mobile during Reconstruction, the entire war, he is just a contrary old cuss, he flew a Union flag on his house on Government Street. He was left alone, um, not really bothered too much, but the entire war, he's got this Union flag flying. He became mayor when the war is over by the Reconstruction officials, but little things like that show you that it's not all one big happy family at least in Mobile. Now, economically, this is probably the most notable aspect here. In Mobile, the biggest impact of the war is economic. The shortages here and the prices. Now, obviously in Mobile, in the, on the home front, as in many southern towns, the civilians are forced to do without. What you've got, the scarce goods you've got, are sometimes appropriate for other things, like the military, obviously. But just some stats here in Mobile. In 1860, I love these numbers here, molasses, which we all used, I guess, 1860, molasses in Mobile was 28 cents a gallon. In 1863, it was $7 a gallon. That's a large increase. Do the math, that's a large increase. Butter in Mobile, butter was 50 cents a pound. In 1864, it's $5 a pound. Okay, if you could get it, by the way. Fly, here's the big one, flour. In 1860, flour cost $45 a barrel, okay? In 1865, $400 a barrel. Now, civilians cannot obviously function like this because of the shortages and things like this. As we'll see, it leads to unrest during the war. Now, what caused this? The easiest answer is the Union blockade, which is to a large extent true, no doubt. Mobile's food imports, folks don't realize this, the cotton came from upstate to Mobile, but the food came from New Orleans. It was a lateral transportation. The, the beef, the pork, things like this came from New Orleans. After 1862 and before, that's cut off. Very tough to get those goods there. So the blockade by, in Mobile by 62 and 63 is very effective. However, it's not just the blockade. Other factors, both legal and illegal, played a role. Example, the Confederate government policy played a role. Example, they divert goods. To, well, by the way, you've got to do this, but they divert goods to the military. They would impress goods for the military. They would impress the railroad lines, a lot of the steamships, things that could be used to import the, the, the short supply of food there was 
in many cases, they're commandeered by the government for the military. That's, that's done in wartime, but it contributes to the civilian hardship, no doubt. Um, the other thing that is a factor is extortion. Now, you want to see people talked about very badly, look at the mobile papers and how they talk about extortionists. That was worse in, in the Mobile Papers, the local extortionist received worse press than any northern soldier because these were your local people. It was, Mobile was full of extortionists if you believe the papers because there's so many letters complaining about this. There's government policies coming out. There's fines. There's imprisonment. Extortion is rampant. They passed laws against stockpiling, hoarding, raising prices, but it still happened. Well, how do you fix this? Economically, what do you do? In Mobile, they try several things. First of all, new organizations. Now, Mobile in 1861, early on, sets up what was called a free market. When it opened, 800 people right away took advantage of its services. By 1863, that number had grown to 2,500. That number's tripled. So you see just from that one simple stat, the need is there, no doubt. There's a military aid society. There's a female benevolent society. There's a mobile supply society. So you've got these organizations, like today in a crisis, organizations spring up to try to meet this economic need. Now, the government also, the local government, tried to address this too. Simple things like in Mobile in the Bay, even back then you had fishing seasons. You had certain times you could fish, harvest oysters. Those were scrapped. If you can pull that thing out of the bay, it's fair game. They, they, they took all those laws away. They made laws here where they, they couldn't require, but they encouraged the military to sell their surplus to the local, if there was one, to the local people. So there are things that government can do, I guess, to meet that. Mobilians are always creative. If those don't work, what is the best way to beat economic restrictions? Smuggling. Mobilians were good at this. My favorite story, I think, of all time is a guy in Mobile who smuggled food. This guy was clever. He would bring back, he went toward New Orleans, he would come back with a wagon with a coffin on the back. Okay? Well, the, the, the guards would feel bad. Okay, sure, you, you're grieving, come on through, right? He did this four times. He, would make, he made four trips, four coffins. They thought this guy's just got bad luck. Well, the guy got cocky, okay? True story, the last coffin, he put the guy's name on the coffin. But he put John Shote, S-H-O-A-T. Now, any farmers, what is a shoat? A shoat's a pig. They got suspicious, opened the coffin, it's full of bacon. He's been smuggling bacon for the last, <laughs> for the last year. He got cocky. Had he not got cocky, he'd been okay, but he put the word shoat on the casket. Go figure. Now, smuggling is rampant. It finally gets to the point where protests break out. One of the great stories in Mobile is the so-called bread riot of 1863. If you read this, by the way, in the New York Times, it's a better story than it actually is. What happened, though, supposedly, in Mobile, the women got upset. Always a bad situation. The ladies got hatchets, axes. They marched down Dolphin Street, breaking store you know, windows and doors, trying to find supplies. Now, the New York Times on the front page took this and ran. It was a great story. It's a whole lot better than their account. In their account, which may or may not be true, they called out the Mobile militia. Well, by now, the young guys are at the war. The militia is the grandfathers, pretty much. Their story says, in the New York Times, the women just beat the tar out of these guys <laughs> and sent them home. It makes for a good story, but it was a great propaganda piece. The bread riot did happen. That se I'm not sure about that second part, but it makes a good story. The point is, by 1863, Mobilians are very frustrated. Now, the attack that Mobile thought would happen never came. The, the military things in Mobile, the two big things we're known for, of course, the Battle of Mobile Bay. In August of 64, by the way, a plug for the hometown, a big reenactment next month, 150th anniversary, it's gonna be a massive reenactment there. That's in, uh, in August of 64. The next April of 65, the Battle of Blakely. I'm gonna show you a few slides here and realize why this stuff survives 
is because Mobile, downtown Mobile, never saw a shot fired in anger, unless it's those ladies in 63. But as far as the northern guys, there's never an attack in downtown Mobile. The city's spared. Nothing goes to the torch. Nothing's blown up. So Mobile escaped that onslaught that many southern cities saw. Now, Mobile will not surrender until April 12th, 1865. Battle of Blakely is April 9th, the same day Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox, the Battle of Blakely is taking place across from Mobile. April 12th, Mobile surrenders. What I want to show you here is some scenes from Mobile, and talk about this a little bit, some scenes from Mobile, and again realize these are possible because of what I just said, the battles that did not come here. As I mentioned a while ago, this is not Civil War, it's a little beyond, because that courthouse is a new building post-Civil War, but this would be Government Street, the main drag in Mobile today. Here's the old Christ Church. The guy that drew this, by the way, ran out of canvas and wants to put Barton Academy. Barton Academy should be way down here, but there it is, he got, he got carried away, he put it way up here, because he's out of space, but in real life, it's way down Government Street, okay? Now, here's the river systems, the railroad systems, that natural funnel into Mobile Bay to the Gulf. The barges would come to Mobile, to the docks. They unload them onto other ships. They go just past Dolphin Island to bigger ships, and then out to the world markets, either to New York or the world markets. It's a natural funnel for the products of our state. Now, this is a 1920s or 30s picture. I use this just to show the old dock scenes. Mobile River looking west to Mobile. This is gone. That's an old courthouse. That's that old Christ Church I showed you a while ago. But what I want to show you here is these old warehouses. A lot of these are Civil War era. They're all gone. Today, if you go to Mobile, the convention center sits right there. When I was a kid, they were still there. In, in the 1960s, they were still there. But that's a dock scene. Same here. These old warehouses would have been there in most cases in the Civil War days. That's looking west from the east side of the river, looking back into downtown Mobile. Familiar picture here, the cotton uh, docks down here. When I was a kid, there were massive wood buildings referred to as the banana docks in Mobile. As I got older, I realized it was the same thing, just you know, renamed and, and retooled, but it's these cotton warehouses. You see the slaves again on the docks here. Very typical scene in Mobile in the Civil War days. Same thing here. That's cotton from upstate coming to Mobile, going out to the world markets. Real quick, a few, then back to the scenes. Some people, these are not military folks. I picked five people real quick to show you, just because I like these folks. This first guy, John Forsyth, an amazing character. This guy in Mobile owned or ran the Mobile paper for 40 years. His father was John Forsyth of Georgia. You've heard of Forsyth County. His father was governor of Georgia. He was Andrew Jackson's secretary of state. Very famous family name. Came to Mobile in 1835. In Mobile, besides being an editor, was mayor twice, in the legislature twice, was U.S. Minister of Mexico, very important figure. Also, in the election of 1860, he is Stephen Douglas's campaign manager, pretty much, for Alabama. So a very important figure. We'll come back to him later. This guy, Henry Hoach, he mentioned the book a while ago. Strange, strange case, okay? Strange case. This guy only lived in America for 10 years, was born in Switzerland, came to Mobile as a young child, child, as a young adult, around 20 years old. In Mobile, roughly 10 years. But when the war starts, this guy, it's, an amazing, it's too long a story to tell you now, when the war starts, this guy gets an assignment to go to Europe as a propagandist. Now, during the war, he worked, by the way, for John Forsyth. He's a journalist working for Forsyth. In Europe, he starts a newspaper called The Index. It's a brilliant plan. In this paper, he prints pro-Southern views. Why is he there? He's trying to convince the Europeans to recognize the South. The beauty of this was people in Europe thought, he's in London, people in London thought it's a London paper. It's not signed. It's a, if you read this paper, you think, well, gosh, guys in London support the South. They didn't know it's a guy from Mobile in London writing this thing. 
It lasted for four. It's an amazing story. It, it's a weekly thing for four years called the Index. An amazing story. He's been called the most effective propaganda agent in the entire war. Um, he's from Mobile. Go figure. This guy, J.C. Knott, Josiah Knott. Strange, strange. I'm putting strange cases up here today. Strange, strange case. A brilliant scientist but also a proponent of racial propaganda. One of the things this guy did, he tried to convince people of a theory called polygenesis. What does that mean? He believed and taught that there were two separate creations. The word poly means many, right? Polygenesis. There's two creations. He tried to tell folks that God at one time created the white European race, pretty much. Somewhere else, everybody else came along. Now, why is that important? If he could convince folks of that, it would easily justify slavery. He taught stuff, I mean, very vile racial propaganda. He taught stuff like slavery is the best the African can ever hope to achieve. Because of these creations, they're different. Um, it, it's, it's very strange stuff. Hotz was one of his protégés. Hotz believed that too. They worked on many, many propaganda pieces where they tried to, to convince folks of this racial theory. Very strange. Uh, Augusta Evans, great from Mobile, an author, did nine major novels. Her two big ones, what, St. Elmo and Beulah. Um, and, and at this time, perhaps the best-selling female author of the day, short of Harriet Beecher Stowe in, in the early 1850s, from Mobile, her works kind of show a very good picture of Mobile society. If you read between the lines, she's talking about Mobile. They're a great, you know, when you teach high school and college, these are great sources, at least excerpts, they're great sources to see how people thought. Because she talks about her philosophy, her, her, her works, if you read them close, they're more than just novels, they actually show life in Mobile, which is great. This one, Kate coming alike also from Mobile, a nurse. She, when the war gets going, goes into the field, uh, works with the troops out there. She writes a very good journal, which is later published called Gleanings of the Southland. Also a great source of Mobile history because she writes about society or views of the war. It's a great, great piece of history that, that is also great for high school kids or college students because it's a first-hand account of Mobile. Now, back around town here, as we go into Mobile, this picture, again around the 1930s, I'm guessing. Um, see the old streetcars there? This is Government Street looking right down toward the river. I use this because most, besides this one here, most of these are Civil War era buildings. A lot are still there. This courthouse is gone. There's a big statue right here of a lady holding the Torch Liberty, which is in the lobby of the Mobile Museum today. That's looking right down Government Street toward the river. Uh, here's Dolphin Street, Bimble Square, Dolphin Street, same thing. These are Civil War era. These are still there in, in most cases. Uh, S.H. Crest took this building years ago. It's being renovated now, but that's Dolphin Street looking right down toward the river also. That's about the way it would have looked in the 1860s. Here's a postcard. Besides this building and the newer battle house, this is Royal Street looking, that'd be looking toward the north. These again, so the banks, that one is still there, that's still there, looking down Dolphin, looking down Royal Street rather, as you go parallel to the river. If you were if you're going this way, the river's right here in downtown Mobile. The old Bimble Hotel, I mentioned a while ago the hotels. There's one of the old hotels. Again, a very nice building. That's that's long gone, many, many years ago. Uh oh, here's the I set the warning sound. <laughs> no. All right, this is the battle house. Um, by, here, by the way, a shameless plug. The Historical Association will meet in Mobile next spring, which I'll talk about later. We're going to have a banquet at the Battle House. This is not the one you see today. This is the original Battle House. This is uh, Royal Street and St. Louis Street. This is the one built in the 1850s. Kids always ask me, by the way, what battle is it named for? Okay? It's not. The guy's name was John Battle that owned the place. His name was Battle. It's not a battle like you know, Civil War Battle. The Battle House is for John Battle. This is the one, though, that was there until about 1905. Uh, trivia, I always ask people, Stephen A. Douglas, 
election of 1860. He's in Mobile on election day. He spent the night there. On, on election day eve, he spends the night here with John Forsyth. His last speech in 1860 was at the Mobile Courthouse, on the steps of the courthouse. They spend the night here in the Battle House. That's a little local trivia there. This one burned in 1905, I want to say. The one today is beautiful, but it's not this one. It's a new version, same location, but it, it's, it's not the same building. All right, the cathedral. Minus the tall spires, this goes back to the 1830s. An amazing structure in Mobile during the Civil War. An amazing, amazing building. We'll tour this thing in the spring, by the way. It's been renovated completely. The, the paint is back to the original. It's a beautiful building. Classic Civil War structure in Mobile. This one I love. This is Christ Church. Now, today, if you go into Mobile, if you go through the twin tunnels, you know what this is? In the tunnels. As you come out of the tunnel, let, let's say you're going toward Gulf Shores from Mobile. When you hit the tunnel and look up, that's the building you see. Now, you'll notice, though, this is gone. In the Civil War days, this was the Mobile landmark. This giant steeple was the Mobile landmark. Today, it's gone. There was a hurricane around, I want to say 1906. The hurricane did not blow this steeple over. It weakened the roof. This thing went straight down. It went through the roof, the church, and into the basement. It tore the entire front of the church off. It's been rebuilt. The church is a fabulous church. We will have our opening session, by the way, in this building in April. It's a beautiful building. It's right across from Mobile's old city hall. This has been gone for years. There was talk, by the way, as late as last year of rebuilding this thing. A stronger steeple, but it hadn't happened yet, but it's a beautiful structure. In Civil War Mobile, as you approach the town, that would have been your landmark. That's what you would see first. As you approach Mobile any direction, that's what you see first is that amazing steeple that goes back to the Civil War days. Beautiful building. This is the old Customs House. This was torn down in the 1960s. That is on, I think, St. Joseph Street, the old Customs House from the Civil War days. It's gone. Still here today, this is the today Mobile Museum. In those days, the Mobile City Hall plus market, I mean, that's a sign, Florida fish over here. It was a market slash city hall up here. Today, you'll see inside the building archways. That's the old stalls where folks sold their produce, their fish, their oysters. Another amazing building. That is on, uh, on Royal Street. The river is just behind it back here. Beautiful, beautiful structure. Barton Academy on Government Street, first public school. That's an amazing building in disrepair. There's a move today to say, hopefully they'll save it. This is about one hurricane away from falling off into the street. This thing's actually leaning today. There's been no money spent in a long time. It's one good storm away from falling apart, but they're trying to, I hope they do, they're trying to save this thing. It's a great classic building from, from pre-Civil War days. Great, great building. Spring Hill College, the Jesuits goes back to 1830s, to the 1830s. Uh, the old hospitals in use today as, um, today it's the public health office, I believe in Mobile, still around. This is, a, this is actually John Forsyth's house. It's no longer there, but this in Mobile today is, this would be Conception Street, this is Church Street. Today in Mobile, the ugliest single building in town is the new courthouse they built. You've seen this, the one's got the little sail. You see this building? It is maybe in the entire south. The ugliest building I know of, it's on this corner. They tore this thing down years ago to put that building there, but that was John Forsyth's house in the 1860s. Also a big, big building. These are still there. Oakley's still there. At one time, Oakley, the land went toward the river. It's, it's several blocks away from the river, but at one time, their land goes all the way down. The Oakley Mansion, Bragg Mitchell House on Sprinkle Avenue. That would be away from town, that can't get away club. Today in Mobile, there's one clue left. There's an apartment complex just across from this called Somerville. Right? That was the name of the place back then. It wasn't called Spring Hill back then. It was called Somerville. There's one sign there on that apartment complex that says Somerville Apartments. That's what they called this area away from downtown up toward uh, the Spring Hill area today. A little higher in elevation. This is the Georgia Cottage, the home of Augusta Evans Wilson. Today it's still on Spring, it's still there Spring Avenue. It's not. It's a private home today. It's hard to even see because of the vegetation in front, but it's still there. The Georgia Cottage was the home of Augusta Evans Wilson. 
This I use for one reason. It's an old painting, but this building right here, this was John Forsyth's office, just the second floor. The Mobile Register, the entire office was up here. On the second floor, salmon shop down here, by the way, they, they sold a little restaurant, but up here was the register office. This is the corner of Dolphin and Royal Street. Today, the Van Antwerp building sits here. See that Van Antwerp seeds over here? Okay, this little building is this building right here. This is in the 1920s. That's that same building. Uh, here it is about five years ago. Today, it's, it was actually torn down about five months ago. There's a crane there today. Our, our friends at the RSA, they're renovating this building. They, they tore it up for a parking lot. It's gone now. But that at one time was where Stephen Douglas spent election night. He and Forsyth were in those, one of those windows up there. They were in the second floor on election night of 1860 getting returns by wire. I mean, Douglas knew he lost, but they're still getting official returns here in this little building in 1860. All right, real quick in Mobile. How does the war affect Mobile? I'm not a military historian, but here are just a few things. Here are the defenses I mentioned a while ago. These rings around the city. This is, by the way, you notice the rings end here. If you go to Mobile today on the connector, we call it I-165, you cross this swamp land. That's that swamp land right there. So that's okay. But they build these rings around the city, three separate rings, redoubts, redans, cannon, uh, earthen works pretty much. When I was a kid, by the way, you could still see the one out by the Mobile Hospital. They've since developed that area, but you could still see those things when I was a kid back in the 60s. The Hunley, of course, a great story in Mobile. Here's the one we'll hear a lot about next month. My goodness, it'll be a big, big event, August of, of, of 2014, next month anniversary. Mobile Bay, Mobile is a very fortified city. You've got, of course, Fort Gaines, Fort Morgan. Fort Powell was a smaller fort. Again, it's gone. When I was a kid, you could see Fort Powell. Hurricane Frederick took Fort Powell out to sea somewhere. It's, it's gone completely. It's no longer there. Of course, these still are. In the bay, you've got the, the floating uh, batteries. You've got the torpedoes, things like that. Of course, Admiral Farragut in 1862 conquers, gotta hurry, conquers New Orleans, wants to get a mobile. He's talked at it by the, by the higher ups, and that never happens. Quickly, there's Farragut. Here's his ship, the Hartford. These are great old uh, DeBoer Review pictures in some cases. Uh, Buchanan, the Confederate commander of the Tennessee. There's the Tennessee. Uh, Fort Morgan, the five star, so you can have firing lines across the fort. Good picture of Fort Morgan. Here's Fort Gaines. Today at Fort Gaines, that's still there. These are kind of gone. That's the, that's the gift shop now. Still a great place to go. Here's, here's the, uh, the, the anchor from the Hartford at Fort Gaines. Good pictures of Fort Gaines. If you like privacy, don't join the Army, by the way. If you like privacy, it's not the place to go, right there. Here's Farragut's attack plans. Remember the famous lashing of the ships? Here's the torpedoes. Kids like this, when kids think of torpedoes, they think of stuff being shot, right? These are great ideas. The torpedo is just a, a waterproof barrel with gunpowder inside with these pegs. Boat it's a peg, it's like a flint. It knocks that peg in, makes a spark, boom, there it goes. The Tecumseh found one of those torpedoes early on. Fair, by the way, Farragut's great line, damn the torpedoes. In Mobile, we're convinced he said, damn, the torpedoes, full speed ahead. So it, 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 it's all emphasis, I think. Uh, famous scene, famous battle painting. The great book Jack Friend wrote, uh, West Wind, Flood Tide. The West Wind blew the smoke back at Fort Morgan. Great scenes of the battle when it's over. We're almost out of time here. The lighthouse at Fort Morgan. I mean, the fort, Fort Morgan, by the way, Mobile Bay took one day, but the fort didn't fall for like 20 days. It's a long, long siege after that. Here's scenes of the fort that's been burned out. Great thing here, this is the Hartford. Remember, remember Farragut's boat, the Hartford? The, Mobile's wisdom here. In 1954, I want to say, or 44, there's a chance to bring this boat to Mobile. It was still around. Here, here's the, actually, there's a sign that says the, the there's a sign up here that says the, the Civil War ship somewhere. This thing was in North Carolina, I believe, at a dock. It actually one day, they came back one morning and it sank. I mean, it, it fell apart finally, but it was still around in the 1950s. This boat was 100 years old by this time, the Hartford was. Go figure. Last thing, Blakely, April of 65, the Blakely campaign, some of the battle scenes. Here's a great uh, Harper's uh, print of, of Blakely. Some of the scenes on the battlefield. The park today is actually a nice, nice park to visit. Mobile surrender. These two guys, Richard Taylor in May surrenders, Canby, 
Confederate general. Little place just north of my school in Mobile, McGee Farm, is where that last surrender took place in May, the last army east of the Mississippi. I believe we're out of time. I see we're out of time here. So you take over now. Thank you very much, by the way. I know we're out of time. Go ahead. They're baffled completely. That's good. <laughs> that's a good sign. There's one. Now, I may or may not can answer. That's a, that's a disclaimer. Uh, was Mobile ever considered as a site for the Alabama Capitol? For the what? Alabama State Capitol. Was it ever considered? No. Nah, not that I know of. Only because of its location so far. I Maybe mean, I don't know. But in my knowledge, I'm not. So I'd ask, I'd ask, I think Mills is back there. I'd ask Mills that. But I think just the location being so far from the geographic center, although river-wise it'd be okay, I don't think it ever was. Uh, Mills, was it? No, I don't think so. Good. If he agrees, he's the authority. Okay? Why yeah. Didn't you teach, why didn't you teach Jason Mobile? Why didn't I what? Why didn't you teach Jason Mobile about the Capitol? Because they invited me here. <laughs> they paid my way to come here. I do it actually every day. That's a good question. I do it every day. I teach at the University of Mobile, and I do. I gave this actually the same talk last week at the Mobile Museum. Yep. Plus, they invited me. Sure. Uh, when Mobile's population was 30,000, was it the largest city in the state of Alabama? I would guess, again, I'd defer to Mills. I think so. Montgomery was probably creeping up. Was it more than 30,000, Mills? No, I think Mobile would have to be the biggest at, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Henry Howard, and I'm a reenactor. I'm also a docent next door to Good. the White House. Um, in two weeks, on the first weekend of August, I'll be the doctor at Fort Morgan. Cool. That's going to be a cool event, by the way. They told me that the, where my hospital is inside the fort, it's right next to the powder magazine. So during the siege, I'm going to have people running back through my hospital getting shot and shell for the cannons. <laughs> by the way, that's going to be a great event. This reminds me of a thing. You talk about propaganda. The Mobile Register, when the Battle of, of Mobile Bay was taking place, you could hear it. In, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good 20 miles away, but you could hear the battle in, in downtown Mobile. The next day, the paper says, don't worry, it's just our guys out there practicing. It's not anything going on. It's just our guys practicing. Don't worry. So who knows? All right, what else? Anything else? I do encourage you, though, come to that thing, uh, and, and if you can, in August, it's going to be spectacular. Yes, ma'am? I think it's on the actual day. I think it's August 5th. I'm not certain of that. August 2nd? 3rd. Okay, August 3rd. I guess it's a weekend, August 3rd. Yeah, it'll be that weekend. Now, look, one more, by the way, one more shameless plug here. You need to come, if you can, next April in Mobile. I'm president of the Historical Association. Our annual meeting will be in Mobile next year on April 9th, 10th, and 11th. Now, here's the beauty. April 9th is the anniversary of the Battle of Blakely. We've got Bob, is Bob in the room, Bob Bradley by chance? Bob who works here on that Thursday night will do a great talk on that, he, he's good. We'll do a great talk on the Battle of Blakely on the anniversary. Uh, that weekend will be kind of a Civil War theme. I mean, it's the, it's the anniversary of Mobile Surrender, anniversary of, of Lee's Surrender. So it'll be a three-day event in Mobile, April 9th, 10th, and 11th in 2015. A lot of these things we saw will be our staging areas. So I do invite you to that. Any other questions? We're almost out of time. I know you guys, you guys have to work, some of you do. Anything else? Well, again, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>